In the winter of 1918, over 20,000 troops of the 32nd Division, comprised of soldiers from the Wisconsin and Michigan National Guard, sailed across the Atlantic Ocean for the battlefields of France. Some would meet the enemy months before the division entered the trenches. Early morning on January 24, 1918, the men of the 107th Engineer Train, 107th Supply Train, 107th Military Police, 32nd Mobile Laboratory, and Sanitary Squads No. 7 and 8 left Camp Merritt, New Jersey for the docks at Hoboken. Waiting there was the SS Tuscania, a converted British passenger liner. Joining 32nd Division units for the voyage was a battalion of the 20th Forestry Engineer Regiment, the 100th, 158th, and 213th Aero Squadrons, a total of about 2,400 passengers and crew. The 20th Engineers were a late addition, bumping the 32nd Division's 107th Ammunition Train from the ship's manifest. We were to sail on the Tuscania, the whole regiment. I checked out a lot of things on the Tuscania. About four o'clock, the major came to me. And he said, you got to transfer to the Arduino, which is a tier 54 in New York. Reason, some engineers came in from California and there's no place to put them. The weather was very cold. Only one battalion of your regiment's going on the Tuscania. Measuring 549 feet, the Tuscania was a young ship barely three years old, built in the same shipyard as the Titanic. As the ship departed New York Harbor, PFC Edward Lauer, a medic with Sanitary Squad Number 8, was anxious about the trip. I mentioned to my buddy, Orville Casper, that I felt I had seen the Statue of Liberty for the last time. Orville felt different about it. He felt that when the war was over, he was going to get married and have a family. The Tuscania joined 13 other ships at Halifax that made up convoy HX-20. The group embarked across a frigid North Atlantic that was also patrolled by German submarines. Aboard, troops were crammed into converted freight holds with mules, boxes of bacon, and airplane parts. They passed the time playing cards, talking, waiting for mealtime, and getting some fresh air during the daily lifeboat drill. Just after midnight on February 3rd, a loud crash and water flowing down the stairs jolted the troops awake. They rushed to the deck with life belts in hand, fearing a submarine attack. Instead, the Tuscania had dipped hard into a wave, washing water over its decks. It took some time for sleep to return. The waters around the British Isles were a favorite hunting ground for German submarines. The German naval minister had promised to his government that the American army would never reach the European battlefields because our submarines will sink them. The Scottish shores emerged on the horizon in the late afternoon of February 5th. The troops grew excited as the Tuscania steamed towards the North Channel, the narrow body of water that separates Scotland and Ireland. Not far away, Lieutenant Captain Wilhelm Meyer, commander of German submarine UB-77, maneuvered his boat to avoid destroyers and patrol boats surfacing occasionally to gather his bearings and recharge UB-77's batteries. With surprise and trembling at 4.50 p.m., in the west, I noticed heavy clouds of smoke. Immediately, the UB-77 was ordered swung around. We hurried up towards these and soon made out a large convoy that was steering in a southeasterly direction toward the North Channel. Soon, I was able to detect a huge seagoing fleet. Meyer had found convoy HX-20, and the Tuscania. I cruised above water back and forth and in front of the advancing transports in order to determine the course and the speed of the Tuscania, as also to work out a suitable method of attack. Meyer submersed his U-boat and moved into attack position as daylight faded away. At 6.05 p.m. I made up my mind to attack. Visibility was poor, as now twilight had set in. Our range estimated at 1,000 meters. Finally, do I see gliding into the periscope an indistinct, befogged shadow. I recognized the sought-for ship. It was dinner time on the Tuscania. Troops ate in shifts and reported topside with life belts once they were done eating. Twilight was the most dangerous time for an attack, and troops were to remain on deck until well after sundown. At 6.40, UB-77 fires two torpedoes. We dive to 30 meters 
the crew and I listening in suspense. One minute, 10 seconds later, a very violent explosion is felt and told us we had hit the target. The torpedo struck the Tuscania's starboard side near the engine room. The explosion immediately threw the ship into darkness and damaged several lifeboats. I was just going to supper when an awful crash took place, and I was almost knocked off my feet. At the same moment, all the lights went out, and I grabbed my life belt. Lauer and the rest of the troops stumbled through the dark to their lifeboat stations. The first lifeboat let down wrong. Ropes tore and plunged into the water. With the ship leaning to its side, Lauer could not board his assigned lifeboat from the deck and had to make a quick decision. As soon as the boat reached water, I noted an empty seat, jumped on the rail, slid down the rope as they were leaving the side of the ship. I braced my foot against the steel and swung into the boat with one foot pulling me into the lifeboat. Hundreds remained on board as the last lifeboat pulled away. Most of the convoy steamed away at top speed while three British destroyers remained to assist the doomed ship. Lauer's lifeboat drifted a mile away. They hailed a passing destroyer. The destroyer failed to see us, but another came along and helped us aboard. It was the HMS Grasshopper. The Grasshopper picked up Lauer and 300 others who were in lifeboats or floating in the water. The overloaded ship then departed for Ireland. Lauer recalls the selflessness of the crew to those rescued. The crew of the Mosquito gave us hot soup, tea, bread, and whiskey. They even took their clothing off and gave their sailing uniforms to those who had jumped into the water. Meanwhile, two destroyers moved in to rescue those still on board the Tuscania. Hundreds of men slid down ropes to the smaller vessels, burning their bare hands. The rescue took two hours. The Tuscania perished below the waves at 9.40. During the rescue, UB-77 eluded all attempts to locate her and returned to finish off the ship. At 10 o'clock p.m., our submarine again approaches, but nothing more of the Tuscania can be seen. The ship has ceased sending out all wireless messages. I assume that she had foundered. The next day, Bauer wrote in his diary, My buddy, Orville Casper, is still among the missing. Casper was one of the 266 who died. 13 of those were from the 32nd Division. Newspapers at home covered every aspect of the incident. The dead were buried with military honors at several sites along the Scottish coast until they could be returned to their families in the United States after the war. In 1920, the U.S. erected a monument on the Isle of Islay to commemorate those lost. Despite the boasting of its naval minister, Germany's navy sank few troop ships carrying the American Expeditionary Force. The rest of the 32nd Division, over 20,000 soldiers, crossed the Atlantic safely by the end of March. With a perilous and costly voyage complete, the 32nd Division now focused on its next task, a final round of training from their French and British allies. 